All right, this is vodcast one of three in which you'll be viewing the digestive system, so let's get started. There are four steps to digestion. We have ingestion of food. We have both mechanical and chemical digestion. Now this involves, in mechanical digestion, taking big particles and breaking them down into small particles. This is no new substances, no new products are being formed here. It is simply the mechanical action of breaking down food. Chemical digestion is using enzymes to break down polymers into their monomer forms. And those monomers that we will be digesting, I'm sorry, we will be absorbing um, in this, our system. And lastly, we have elimination, which is the removal of the waste products that we did not absorb. So here's a quick overview of the pathway that food is going to take as it's traveling from your mouth, and your teeth are going to grind that up, into your pharynx region at the back of your throat, down your esophagus, and right behind this liver here, it will enter into your stomach. From your stomach, it will move into your small intestine, which is in the center here, and then small intestine into your large intestine, and finally into your rectum, and then out your anus. Now there are also three accessory organs, which we will talk about in a second vodcast, that assist with the action of the digestive system. Okay, so the first place that food is going to make contact with is, with is the mouth. Now, the mouth functions obviously in digest, ingestion as well as mechanical and chemical digestion. So the first place we have that mechanical digestion is the teeth. So the teeth are used to grind up that food into smaller parts in order to increase that surface area. Then we have four sets of salivary glands. Their function is to liquefy the food through the release of the saliva, as well as that saliva contains salivary amylase. Now amylase ends in an ASE, so it's an enzyme here. Salivary amylase will take starch and break it down into maltose, not the monomer form yet. Monomer form yet. Maltose is still a disaccharide, so still more chemical digestion needs to occur, which will happen later. We also have the lubrication and the softening of the bolus. Now the bolus is um, a just the word to describe the saliva mixed with the chewed food. We now call that substance um, a bolus. As well as the saliva also will kill bacteria that is contained within the food. We also have the tongue. The tongue will move around the food within our mouth. Um, it activates our taste buds which are that are contained on the tongue and it pushes that bolus to the back of the throat. Now that back of the throat region is called the pharynx. Now the pharynx has um, a few functions. So upon swallowing, there is a reflex center um, that allows the soft palate, palate um, which is the area up here, um, which will separate our nasal cavity from the back of our throat so that that bolus doesn't move into our nasal cavity. As well as we also have another structure called the epiglottis. And that epiglottis is just a flap of tissue that upon that bolus pushing down on it will cover over the top of the trachea so that the bolus um, doesn't lead into, the, into our respiratory center or into our lungs. And this is also the beginning of peristalsis. All right, so now that our bolus is in our esophagus, it is going to move down this long muscular tube that will lead to the stomach. There is no digestion that occurs here. The food moves through the action of peristalsis. Um, at the end of the esophagus, right in this connection with the stomach, which is shown here also, um, is something we call the cardiac sphincter. So this is just a ring of muscle which um, stops the acid contents that are in the stomach from moving back up into the esophagus. If it does, that's where we get heartburn from. When the acid chyme, we call it chyme at that point, when acid chyme moves back up into the esophagus and connects with that lining. So this movement of peristalsis down the esophagus, pushing that bolus along, it's best described as if you could imagine putting a tennis ball at the top of a tube, uh, let's say an elastic tube, and you wanted to move that tennis ball through. You would have to squeeze with your hands just above the tennis ball all the way down the tube until you got to the very end. That would be an example of rhythmic muscle contractions, the same as peristalsis that moves that bolus along through the esophagus. Now this peristalsis action, peristalsis action also continues along through the entire digestive tract, but it begins in the esophagus.
So once that bolus has passed that cardiac sphincter, it has entered into this thick muscular J-shaped organ. Now it is a muscular organ so that it has the ability for the mechanical digestion to occur. It will churn and liquefy the food through the action through muscle action. This is also aided by um, the structure we call rugae, which are just ridges or folds within that stomach lining. Um, the stomach also will store and release the food through the pyloric sphincter, which we'll talk about later, and it also makes its own gastric juices, which are just all of the substances um, that are released from the gastric cells in order to aid in the chemical digestion of that bolus that has now entered into the stomach. So the cells of the stomach, or the gastric cells, will release gastric juices, which contain four things. They will release water, um, which acts as a solvent. They will release pepsinogen, which is involved in protein digestion. They will release hydrochloric acid, um, which creates that acidic environment to turn that bolus into an acidic chyme. We'll talk about these two on the next slide. And they also release mucus. So the mucus is a protection barrier so that the hydrochloric acid and the pepsinogen do not make contact with our gastric cells. Um, and if that fails us, what happens then is with the creation of an ulcer. All right, let's look at the hydrochloric acid and the pepsinogen in a little bit more detail. So when food enters into our stomach, specifically proteins enter into our stomach, we have this hydrochloric acid that is released from those cells of the stomach. This creates a really low pH, about two and a half, um, which will kill any bacteria and also this denatures salivary amylase at this point so that we have the stop of the, the digestion of starch. So when, in the presence of hydrochloric acid here, this pepsinogen, an inactive form of the enzyme, is converted to the active form of the enzyme. That is called pepsin. Pepsin then, in its active form, will start to digest protein in a chemical digestion into peptides. So it begins to break those large proteins into smaller proteins in which we call peptides. All right, so our bolus has passed that cardiac sphincter. We've just talked about how the stomach has action, mechanical and chemical action. And now we're moving that acidic chyme, which we call it. Um, and here's the spelling of that, acidic chyme. And that will leave through what we call the pyloric sphincter. So the stomach begins and ends both with muscular sphincters that only open and close and allow the bolus or the acidic chyme to be spurted out into that first part of the small intestine, which we call the duodenum. Now that pyloric sphincter will allow small amounts of the acid chyme to be spurted into the small intestine. The small intestine has three regions, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. These first two regions, they are involved in the remainder of chemical digestion to break down the macromolecules into their monomer form so that the ileum can absorb, uh, can absorb those monomers. Okay, so that small intestine's function is digestion um, and absorption. So the absorption that occurs in the jejunum and the ileum require a significant amount of surface area in order for those monomers to be absorbed very quickly. So those structures of the ileum and the jejunum, they have highly folded walls, which would create a very large surface area. The surface area of, of this is about approximate to the size of a tennis court, and it does this um, by extreme folding um, of the walls. So you can see here in this diagram here, this structure right here we call a villa. Singular is villus, plural is villi. And on top of that, if you can see right here, this is blown up. And so here would be one cell, and on top of that is even more of these microvilli, which increase the surface area even further. So this small intest these parts of the small intestine are significantly folded in order to increase the surface area. Now we're going to talk about these structures and what's within a villus a little bit more later. Okay, so the first function of the small intestine chemical digestion as well as physical digestion. Now we, this is where we have a lot of enzymes um, acting in this first part of the small intestine, in that duodenum. So first off, we have pancreatic juices. What this means is that these are um, uh, substances that are released from the pancreas through a duct and are released into the small intestine, the duodenum, um, in order for them to begin digesting um, some of these um, polymers. So first off, we have a 
uh, pancreatic amylase, just like the salivary amylase, which digests starch into maltose. We also have a lipase, and that lipase breaks down lipids into fatty acids and glycerol. Then we have another digestion of proteins, and that is done by trypsin, and that breaks it down again into peptides. Um, and then we have nuclease, which takes that RNA and DNA and breaks it down into nucleotides. So this all comes from the pancreas, and therefore it's the pancreatic juice. Then we also have the cells of the small intestine, which release their own enzymes, and these are called intestinal juices. And so these involve peptidases, which are peptides into amino acids, nucleoside aces, which break down nucleotides into their sugar, phosphate, and nitrogen-containing base. Um, and then we also have maltase, which now breaks down the amylase um, products in, from the maltose into two glucose molecules. So the small intestine is the site of action for all of these enzymes listed on this slide. Um, now we also have a physical digestion, um, which we'll talk a little bit about more. It's bile, and it comes from the gallbladder, and we'll talk about that in the second vodcast. Okay, so here's where we're going to talk about those villi in a little bit more detail. So this is the second function of the small intestine, where we see absorption of all of those monomers that were broken down by the pancreatic juices and the intestinal juices. So here are those finger-like projections um, that exist, and I'm just going to outline the villus here. Inside of each villus, um, we have two things. We have capillaries, and these are blood capillaries. And those blood capillaries will absorb glucose, amino acids, and nucleotides. Then we also have this lacteal, and that lacteal will absorb glycerol and fatty acids, and those are transferred into our lymphatic system, which we'll talk about when we talk about the, in the circulatory system. Okay, to outline these in the diagram so that you could see them a little bit better, the blood capillaries, these are the red structures that are heading into, the red structure here that's heading into the villi, and then the blue, which we represents deoxygenated blood, um, which leaves the other end, um, and those are the blood capillaries. Now, when we're looking at that lacteal, the lacteal is white, and now I'm going to outline it here in black. This lacteal runs up the center of each villi and then exits out of it. So that structure that runs right up through the middle that's surrounded by those blood capillaries are the lacteals. All right, now that we've digested and absorbed within the small intestine, we are those that waste is now leaving the small intestine and heading into the large intestine. Now sitting right at the bottom of the large intestine is the appendix. So this has lymph tissue and it helps fight infection. It's thought to be the home for the extra good bacteria that exists in our large intestine. Um, now this is the thing that you might have heard of before that can get inflamed and that is called an appendicitis and if it needs to be remove, it's called an appendectomy. All right, so the large intestine consists of three structures. We call the colon, the rectum, and the anus. So the colon, yes, it is broken in different parts, but we're just going to summarize it up as the colon. The small intestine would sit in the middle here, and there's the appendix. So the food, or the waste at this point, will travel in through the, um, into the colon, and then into the rectum, and then out the anus. The two main functions of the large intestine are first absorption of water. So we've already absorbed our nutrients and now this is where we our, our body determines on how much water we keep and how much water we need to release. It also absorbs salts. Um, we also receive and store undigestible uh, wastes and fibers. And it does this um, through using E. coli and anaerobic bacteria. The function of those bacteria are to eat the wastes and um, produces some vitamins and amino acids, as well as growth factors, and also produces their own waste, which is the methane gas, which is the smelly stuff. So once that large intestine has reabsorbed um, much of the water, we're left with this waste material that we call feces. Um, that feces will begin to build up in the rectum. Now the rectum has these stretch receptors on the side of it, and those receptors will lead up to the brain within the central nervous system. When enough of the feces have built up and the stretch receptors are being stretched farther, um, then that's where we get the urge to defecate. So upon defecation um, and 
stimulation by the brain to say muscles contract, um, those muscles will contract and pass, the feces will pass through the anal sphincter, yes, another sphincter, just like the cardiac sphincter and the pyloric sphincter, and out the anus. Now, if the large intestine absorbs too, if the large food moves through the large intestine too slowly, um, then too much water might be absorbed, and therefore we get a very hard feces, which can lead to constipation. So that brings us to the end of our first vodcast. The end, get it? Ha ha ha. Um, and you can look at vodcast number two, which is talking about accessory organs.